that's it. Now we're recording. Lovely, perfect. Okie dokes. Um, the first thing um, we'd like to do is just to find out um, a little bit from you um, where you traveled from today, because obviously you're coming from very far away. So I'm launching a little poll. And if you wouldn't mind just answering um, and telling us where you've come from today, that would be brilliant. Um, just to have a little snapshot for us. Okay. Um, okay, so this is testing my geography. I know I'm in parts, <laughs> um, but I think it's east. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Unfortunately, I'm an imposter and I'm from Essex. But just oh, Gemma. Me too. Gemma, oh, I'm from Essex. You said me too. Linda, hi. Yeah, <laughs> hi. West um, Essex massive. It does matter, <laughs> Essex. Absolutely. And I'm cool. writing this down now that we have two big from brilliant Essex. beacons and supporters <laughs> from Essex. Excellent. Essex people, you're very welcome. Of course you are. Thank you. Um, has everybody um, voted? Yeah. yeah? Oh, brilliant. So we have quite um, a broad, I'll just do a little quick screen, and we have quite a broad um, variety. So Stevenage, East Hearts, North Hearts, uh, and then Wellin, Hearts, and uh, the Quorum, St Albans. Brilliant. And I'll, I'll be ending the poll now. Up oh, here's the share the results um, for you who would like to see them. There we go. Okay, the next thing um, I would like to try out with you is I am going to share a whiteboard and I don't know if any of you have used the Zoom whiteboard before, um, no. but I would like um, you, and I'll do that now, so we scribbled already a little bit on there, <laughs> am I going to take some off? as such. So you can, um, if you click on your um, options bar in whiteboard annotate or view, you can kind of pick um, something to draw or something to write. So have a little bit of fun. And what I'd like you to do um, whilst we're still waiting for a few people to arrive, is just for you to kind of write or draw on the whiteboard um, something that represents the dream for your community. And I will leave that up for a little bit whilst I'll do a few introductions. So write or draw something that represents the dream for your community. I'm sorry to ask, but where's the options thing? Yeah. The options thing is um, you have to click on the view options on the top. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And then annotate. Yeah. Yeah. So view options, annotate. If it's just for a little bit of fun. So it'll be lovely. If you could just put a few lovely little words on there. And whilst you are um, doing it, um, I would like to introduce um, our um, lovely host today, um, which is Helen Ashby. Maybe Helen, you can just um, say hello just for a moment and um, tell us maybe a little bit about um, Ambition Broxbourne. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this event that we've, we're running in conjunction with The Hive and Carina, um, which is sponsored by the Cooperatives UK. Um, we're here to support businesses and the communities within the borough of Broxbourne through that various mechanisms and our events that we're running. Um, we've got lots of different events coming up and we've been running since I started in place uh, last year, actually a year ago yesterday. Um, so there's lots of different events, social media, PR with Journolink, we bring people in like Karina, Google Digital Garage. Um, and if there's anything you're looking for that is not currently provided, please come to us. We can look to put something on either with yourselves or we can find partners to do that. 
uh, we're also acting as an intermediary for the Kickstart program. So if you are in the borough of Broxbourne, we can support you with that. If you're outside, we can certainly refer you on to your local intermediary. Um, there's lots of other things that we're involved with. So if there's anything we can do to support you in your business, please come to me and we'll we'll do what we can to support you in your business and your in your journey. I hope you enjoy the, the event today. Thank you so much, Helen. And I really need to say thank you to Helen to kind of uh, help putting this event on. It is fantastic. And maybe our um, our lovely kind of guest speakers can say hello very, very briefly, just a little wave so that people know your, 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 your names and your lovely faces. So um, if I can have a wave from um, Deborah, please, from Wigington Shop. And a little hello. Um, and if I can have a little hello um, from Mikal and Seema from the Wormley and Turnford Big Local. And a lovely way from Victoria Hobson from Mudlarks in Hartford. Morning. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you all. Okay, so today is really a lot about you lovely people all coming together and listening, especially to our guest speakers. So. The first bit of um, today's event, I will just tell you a little bit about the Hive and what a co-op model is. It's really just an introduction, just a flavor, um, because um, it's really mainly about um, hearing from the people on the ground who are doing fantastic work, who have been doing fantastic work in the communities in Hertfordshire and of course in Essex for a long time. So um, that's really what today is about. I will talk, as I said, a little bit about um, the Hive and the co-op models. Then we will have um, 10 minutes for each, each guest speaker followed by a Q&A. Um, and you can use the chat function for that, or you can um, um, speak up as well. We, we are less than 20 people in the room, so that is, is, is perfect for a bit of interaction. Um, and then, um, then there's the next guest, next guest speaker, then, an, uh, then the third guest speaker. And then um, I will tell you a little bit about where you could probably get some seed funding from, hopefully in Hertfordshire, if you want to get anything started. And then we have hopefully some time for a final um, Q&A. So I hope that's okay with everybody. I will stop sharing the whiteboard in a minute. And Helen, if you could um, share the screen, um, for the presentation, that would be brilliant. And it, when you're ready. Brilliant. Karina, will we get a copy of the presentation? Yes, you will, you will, you will get um, a copy of the presentation, absolutely. So it's great that so many of you are here today. And I need to say a massive thank you to Helen at Broxbourne Council, who has an up, been an absolutely stand supporting me to organize this event and to all the three wonderful guest speakers that you will hear today. My name is Corina Hartwig and I live in East Hearts with my family and I have been involved in community projects and social enterprises for over 10 years. I'm pleased to be able to facilitate today's event. I'm all about better business and stronger communities and often work on contracts or in my roles as an associate advisor for the Plunkett Foundation and approved um, provider for the Hive, which I represent today. I specialize in supporting startup businesses and grass grassroots community organizations. I also had the privilege to work in grant making for the Big Lottery Fund and for a European funded program across East Hearts. Um, and Epping. And I'm also known as the funding doctor. And sometimes with my funding doctor coat on, I deliver um, funding workshops. And I have delivered some webinars recently for the wonderful organization called Sember. Next slide, please, Helen. <laughs> So today's digital event is very kindly hosted by the economic development team at Broxbourne Borough Council and it's been made possible thanks to the Hive. I will skip that bit because I told you a little bit about the overview already. So if we could um, see the next one, that would be brilliant. 
let me tell you a little bit about the Hive. So the Hive is the business support program from the Cooperatives UK and the Cooperative Bank for people wanting to start and grow cooperative or community enterprises. As part of its commitment to supporting cooperatives, the Hive provides resources to help grow new co-ops and community businesses to start up, existing co-ops to grow and non-co-ops to convert. It offers a mix of online resources, opportunities for advice and training to help be build better cooperative businesses. The Hive offers up to 12 days bespoke support, training and mentoring for groups looking to set up a cooperative. Existing co-ops with ambitions to grow can also benefit from the support from the Hive. So if you're not a corporate at the moment, but thinking about converting, um, the Hive is for you as well. Could we have the next slide, please, Helen? So the Hive programme is being delivered by the Cooperatives UK, who is the trade body and network for Britain's thousands of cooperatives. Cooperatives UK works to promote, develop and unite member owned businesses, which are worth more than 37 billion to the economy. That's quite powerful, isn't it? The Hive is supported by the Cooperative Bank, the only UK high street bank with a customer led ethical policy and cooperative values enshrined in its article of association. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, who is running um, the Hive Pro? Um, sorry, I said that, <laughs> sorry. So what is a um, cooperative business model, really? So it's really quite kind of simple in a nutshell. It's a business owned by its members, a group of people with a common need. A co-op is owned by its members, not by big investors. Members get a chance to have a say in how the co-op is run and the members control the business. The members benefit primarily from the co-op. It aims to generate a surplus which will be distributed among the members, can be reinvested in the business, or will benefit the local community, for example, through a community fund or for improved services or for delivering more services. Cooperatives are everywhere, really big, small, medium, and all over the globe in every industry. And then I've brought up some um, few examples of some cooperatives. If Helen could um, call up the next slide, please. You will obviously hear in a minute from Deborah at Wigington, who is a co-op shop, a community run shop in Wigington near Tring. But maybe lovely people in the audience, can you tell me, uh, or if you want to in the chat, you can share also ideas about the co-op. So what, what are some examples that you have? <clears throat> Feel free to tap a few in the chat. Um, and I'm trying to see, I kind of can't see the chat right now at the moment, <laughs> um, but I leave it as it is. Um, I hope you're sharing a little bit in the chat, but I will um, tell you a few um, examples. Obviously um, you have community shops, community pubs, you have also agricultural cooperatives, student housing co-ops, tech co-ops, social care co-ops, community energy, community transport, community child care, community housing. Um, for example, the Coin Street Community Builders, um, they have um, taken an image from in London, um, our community housing. You even have community natural swimming ponds that I'm really keen on having some more in, in the UK, especially in Hertfordshire, it would be fantastic. There are some in Germany. Um, and you can obviously mutualize your local economy. And CoinStream has an example of the Oxo Tower Wharf and Gabriel's Wharf in London, um, where there's a local um, co-op economy flourishing, which is fantastic to see. Okay. Then the next slide, I'm going to talk about um, why consider the co-op um, business model. 
And again, if you want to, you could kind of share in the chat a little bit why you think we should um, consider a co-op business model. What are the um, motivations? Or maybe you can shout out so I can hear a little bit. Let's have a little bit of a shout out. Tell me, why do you think we should, um, we should have cooperatives? Anyone want to speak? <laughs> no? <laughs> This is a totally new concept to me. I had no idea that it worked like this. <laughs> so that's yeah. okay. That's fine. That's brilliant as well. That's why that's that's what it, why we put you on this event. Excellent. Uh, okay. I would say, Corina, one thing: empowerment, for example. Empowerment, yeah. absolutely. Inclusion. Inclusion, absolutely. Inclusion. Yeah. And it brings communities together when they feel included. Yes, absolutely. Common, Anybody? I would say, common purpose as well. For example. Yes. Yeah. And human interaction, human connection, which is important mm. at the moment as well. But obviously cooperatives build communities. Okay. Cooperatives create sustainable jobs. Cooperatives inspire participation and they're a democratic and sustainable business model. And I'm just going to give you a kind of a few facts here really to underpin um, that. And I've taken the facts from the newest UK's co-op sector report from Cooperatives UK, which came out just very recently. And um, don't feel like you have to scribble all of that down. We will also share some resources with you afterwards with some links, especially to those reports as well. But let me just give you um, a few, uh, a little flavor. 76% of co-op startups are still flourishing after the difficult five first years of a startup. And that's compared to non-cooperative, non-community businesses. Um, sorry, I just had to admit for <laughs> someone in the, uh, in the chat. Um, so um, only 42% of um, non-cooperative businesses um, flourish beyond the five years after startup. Then the annual turnover of the UK um, sector uh, was up to 38.2 billion um, on the previous year with an increase of 340 million, which is fantastic. And the UK has now 7,063 independent co-ops employing 241 714 people and they have over 14 million members now there is empowerment isn't there yeah. and who own and have a say in the na in the in the na nation's corps um, operating and obviously um kind of adding to the build back better um, at the moment there's obviously an urgent need for more democratic economy and I hope these are kind of enough reasons for you to possibly consider setting up um, a cooperative. That brings me to the kind of next slide where I'm just going to tell you very, very briefly how you can go on to set one up. Um, and then I will very shortly after that um, hand over to Deborah from Wigington, who is going to tell us um, all the story of, of Wigington. But let me just very briefly tell you how you can go about setting one up. Um, so today is really just about insp inspiring, um, in inspiration from the people in Hertfordshire who are running cooperatives, community businesses at the moment. Um, so that's why it's just a little overview, but that's why I don't have to have enough time to go into detail um, with regards to legal structures. And to be honest, if you're interested in legal structures, um, then um, there is a whole other world of webinars that you can attend. But you can start a co-op or community business from scratch. If you have identified a common need, that's what Mikhail also said, got your community rallied around and have a go and go get an attitude really. So anybody can do it. Alternatively, you can obviously convert a non-co-op business into a community owned through a community buyout, for example, or an employee buyout. 
and I'm all um, I'm sure you all know a good example of a employee owned business, which is the John Lewis and Waitrose yes. partnership, for example. So they exist in very big, but they exist also in very small. Um, I was going to play you a little video um, from um, Cooperative UK um, on YouTube, but I'd rather now hand over to um, Deborah from Wigington to give her, um, to, to let you hear her voice. Um, and I will um, give you a link in the follow up to the video on Cooperatives UK YouTube channel um, that can tell you more about how to set one up, but also about legal, legal structures if you're interested. Um, so without further ado, um, maybe um, Helen, if you can just um, bring up the next slide, which is just introducing Deborah really very, very briefly. Um, Deborah and I met um, a few years ago um, when I was um, um, working for the Plunkett Foundation and I helped a handful of positive community activists, if I may call you like this in Wigington, <laughs> to realize your vision, but I am going to kind of hand over to you now. Um, if you want to share your screen, lovely Deborah, and tell your story, we would love to hear it. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Um, I'm just madly trying to find my slide. So yes, yeah, so I'm from um, representing the Wigington Community Shop. We're based in a village which is just nestled outside of Tring um, at the very top of the um, Chilterns and um, we have about 620 households. Uh, we are uh, lucky to be on the Ridgeway Walk so we get lots of walkers and horse riders and, um, and um, so why did we decide to set up a community shop? Well, while Wigington has an amazing, thriving social scene, um, a fantastic pub, a couple of churches, a school, a primary school and a preschool and lots of interest groups. Um, a young family that moved to the village, a lady called Rebecca Fleckney, identified that there was a real lack of, of a community hub where you could just turn up whenever on your own terms and just meet up with people and um, have a natto and a cup of tea and you know perhaps be able to buy some lovely local pr produce and stuff that you might have run out of um, you know in the cupboards while you're making a meal or, or whatever. And she mooted this idea to a few of us and we just thought it was a fantastic idea. Um, and as Karina has said, one of the things about um, these community initiatives is it really you know, brings people together. Um, and um, what we found was we very quickly had a huge working party that were really desperate to see how they could help to make it succeed. So the first thing we needed to do was to understand the wider appetite for this. Um, and where we are located, we're actually not that far away from a, a couple of towns. I've already mentioned Trink. It's probably about a mile, mile and a half down the road. And we've also got um, Burke Hampstead and Chesham, which aren't too far away. So we're not the typical MO for a community shop in the, in the fact that, um, you know, we do have amenities quite and near to us on our doorstep but so this consultation was really important to understand you know how would people use it um, and what would they need um, and the results that came back were really positive and people said that they really loved the idea of a community hub you know and being able to get stuff easily you know walk out their door and be able to trot down the road instead of having to get in the car and um, the next challenge for us after that was there wasn't a natural place to locate this um, only because there wasn't um, any of the premises in the village that we could take on and move into. So we looked at um, a variety of options um, and many years ago there had been a scout hut located on our sports field which had long been demolished 
but, um, the more we looked into this, the more it felt like a natural location. There's a car park, there's a sports field, a children's playground. It sits in the heart of the village near to the pub um, and the school. Um, this land is owned by our parish council. So we um, needed to put together a proposal for them that, um, that um, would allow them to understand exactly what, um, the, you know, what we were looking to locate there, given the fact that also we live in an area of outstanding natural beauty, so we can't just go checking up buildings where, where we want to. Um, and they were incredibly supportive because they could understand the benefits of creating this community hub that um, would bring people together. And so what we had to do then was really look at how to put together all the aspects of building uh, the premises, putting together the business, you know, what type of business we would be, how that would be run. You know, there's a million different aspects. And this is where the support from Karina was incredibly important for us. Um, we spoke to her at great length. Plunkett were amazing in terms of, of signposting us to different resources um, and advice, um, other shops, uh, community shops, and the learning we could get from them. So to really cut to the chase, we, um, we found that in our village, we had um, uh, so many people that were highly skilled that were willing to offer their services to help us to get the project off the ground. We had lawyers, we had uh, architects, interior designers, retail experts, envir environmental um, experts, which allowed us to put together a really professional proposition um, that uh, could allow people to invest in this project. You know, bearing in mind that we were starting from a green field, which you will see on the, on the screen at the moment, there was literally a table tennis table and a couple of uh, picnic tables. So it was very hard for people to understand what they were buying into. Um, the cooperative model absolutely made some sense for us because what we wanted was to bring our community together and for them to feel that they were playing a part in it and driving it forward. So we established ourselves as a community benefit society um, and um, put together a business plan accordingly. And then to raise the money to be able to build our shop, we um, launched a share offer. And this we did at a public consultation where for the first time people were able to come together and actually tangibly see what the shop was about. We'd set up our village hall as um, effectively what the shop would be. There was a little cafe area that was serving teas and coffees and lovely homemade cakes. There was um, a supply affair that really showcased all the lovely local produce and the convenience goods they'd be able to buy. There was a, an architect's model that could really you know, people could get, get their hands on and understand what the shop would look like and feel like. Um, and, you know, it was a bit of a pivotal moment for all of us that were involved in actually getting this off the ground to establish it, because it was the first time where people were really having to invest their cold, hard-earned cash in this project, which, um, which thankfully they did. Um, and the share offer we administered through um, an online platform called crowdfunder um, which was a, a really effective way to be able to take people's money uh, um, uh, in a safe a safe way and it also allowed us to match the funds we raised through our community through the big society capital and I know I'm using so many acronyms and I'll put links in the chat so that you can sort of look at what all of these things mean, um, which meant effectively we could double what we'd raised um, to uh, be able to fund the shop. We also had a fantastic lady on our management committee who was uh, had expertise in applying for grants, which topped up our funds. 
So following that share offer, we were in the most exciting position, having acquired all the necessary planning permissions to actually start the build of our shop. And this was in the summer of 2018. Um, we had um, a, a gorgeous builder in the village that, that built that and did bent over backwards to make sure that our budget fitted our, um, you know, we could get this beautiful shop come out of the other end of it. And on the 1st of December, 2018, we opened our doors for the first time and we absolutely haven't looked back. The, the membership are incredibly active. M many of them support it beyond the, the, the financial input they've given. They will volunteer. We, we have people working behind the scenes. We have an AGM um, once a year, obviously, that is incredibly well attended. And, um, you know, the, the, the shop is thriving despite this background of, um, of COVID. Uh, we, you know, we've had some tricky months where we've not been able to do some of the things that we would normally do um, that have affected our takings, but there is incredible support and, um, you know, long may that continue. Um, so that's, that's our story. Um, if you have any questions, um, please don't hesitate to ask, put them in the chat or, or just shout them out to me. That's fantastic, Deborah. Thank you so much. It brings back so many brilliant memories and it still makes my kind of makes me feel all warm and fuzzy. It's it's incredible. You you all did a fantastic, fantastic job. Yes, show those beautiful photos as well, please. Um I have a uh, important bit, the cake. Yeah, cake. Oh no, what time is it? Eleven, quarter ten past eleven. <laughs> And we want cake. Sorry, guys, we can't serve you um, virtual cakes. I'm we, sorry. Can we, Corina, can we organize a delivery of cakes, please? Yes, we we'll do you, that Deborah. next time. Um, whilst we're organizing that behind the scenes, would you lovely people um, ask Deborah any questions you may have? I have a question. Um, you say that people invest. Um, like with, I don't know if John Lewis and Waitrose in their partnership, they... Uh, the shares give a dividend or anything. Is that how it works? It, I mean, that's what I understand from many moons ago, but is that? That's a really that good right? question, actually. Um, the way that we're set up as a community benefit society, um, we've been very careful to um, for our investors to understand that this isn't, you know, something they can invest in to retire on, um, yeah. you know, yeah. invest their pension funds in and whatever. Um, our, our, our real kind of um, true north is about delivering to our community. So the plan is um, that we will really, once we get to the point where we're, we're sustainable, we, we, we have this big society capital loan that we are paying off. Um, and once we pay that off, we will be completely com community owned, which will be amazing. And then the profits will um, be ploughed back into community projects. So whether that be, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, upgrades to the playground, or you know, people will have the opportunity to put forward community idea project ideas, which these funds will go into, rather than it being about people getting return on investment for their for their share. But that is um, as part of our rules. That is part of what could be done. So if people move out of the village or want to pass shares on, um, you know, um, one, one aspect actually, Seema, that um, was a part of our share offer is we were able to get tax relief on share offers, depending on obviously your own tax situation. So that was one, um, you know, kind of incentive uh, if you like, from a financial point of view, but it's it's more about being part of a community enterprise and driving that and influencing it rather than a financial investment. So Which people are investing to get that facility for themselves as well, which yeah. is, you know, as long as people have got the... Okay, I also want to know what the average donation was, not donation, whatever, investment. Yeah, so we this was a really tricky, um, you know, debate um, in terms of because the whole point of the shop is to be accessible to everybody and um 
you know, there's um, a huge range of um, share offers when you start to dig into this community shop world. Um, and we decided because we were starting from scratch, we had, you know, significant build, uh, um, you know, costs to take into consideration. So we set our shares at £250 each um, so that we stood a good chance of getting the funds we needed. Um, and, you know, the way the way we, we saw it was obviously there is this financial goal that we need to reach, which is why we set it at that. But if not everybody could, you know, um, could contribute depending on where they were in their life. They have, might have other priorities or, you know, um, so we looked at it. There is people that were so willing to give their time. And then there was those that were able to help um, finance it as well. So that was the balance we had, which, you know, I mean, I always say, because I do the PR for the shop as well and the marketing, this shop is the success of literally hundreds of people making it happen so that's gone off a bit piece from your question but i hope that answers it <laughs> right is there any more questions for deborah for now or would you be um would you really like to hear from mikhail and the lovely Seema at um wormley and turnford big local what their project is all about if there is no more questions for Deborah for now. Then Deborah, thank you so much. Um, but I'm sure it was it's, it's just brilliant to kind of really hear hear this kind of really heartwarming and it's a success story. You 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 won awards as well. You've done so brilliantly yeah. to kind of pull it all off. So um yeah, oh <laughs> really big applause. Um but obviously um Deborah will be um there before um we, we finish the, the event this morning. So if you have any more questions for Deborah, she'll be in the QA a little bit later. Um thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um now then I would like to hand over to Mikhail and Seema if you would like to kind of um share. You've, I think you've got a presentation to share as well for us Absolutely. to view. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'll just say, Mikhail is our own, one of our workers um, in the Wormley and Turnford Big Local, which is a lottery funded um, project. Um, Hopefully you can see it, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. And I'm, I'm a volunteer, I'm almost a resident because I'm just only slightly out of the area, but it's close enough, but I, have been involved for about four or five years now and um so i know una una used to work for us as well um and uh mikhail has taken over and he's our community development officer i think okay uh very quickly we've prepared um a presentation and uh, we've kind of you know rehearsed it so hopefully it will go well today um I will just give you a background uh, to the project uh, and I'll give you uh, a context basically. Um, uh, some of you know this project quite well um, and we've already had a chance to work with some of you um, who are actually attending this, this webinar today. So uh, in a nutshell, very quickly, what is Big Local? It is a community-led program that aims to bring positive lasting change to the local area. So while I was listening to you, Corina, it really, really directly corresponds with the COP ethos, if you like, in many ways. It is community-led, it is resident-led, or it is, you know, um, members-led, if you like. Um, Big Local, as a concept, was established by the Local Trust, which obviously is all 150 um, uh, Big Local areas um, across the country, and in total, um, Local Trust, uh, via Big Lottery Fund, uh, invested £220 million uh, in different areas, big local areas uh, across across the country. So that's lottery funding over 10 to 15 years. Um, there are two um, big local areas in Hertfordshire. We are one of them. Uh, and then the other one is a Boromut in Hartsmere. Um, the really important thing to remember, so um, uh, I'm the development manager for Warmington for Big Local. Now have a small um, team of, uh, of workers. We have, uh, you know, and a few members of staff working on the project. However, the, the, the key thing to remember for each one of you um, is, is to remember that direct direction and delivery of uh, WTBL is guided uh, by partnership with residents, 
as Sima said, volunteers through consultation with the local community. So at the moment, there are 11 part members sitting on the um, uh, uh, on our partnership, basically, um, and uh, you know they help to guide um, you know this project uh, you know forward, if you like. And again, the other thing, again, we talked already quite a lot about empowerment, um, sense of belonging, um, community cohesion. So this this project brings together local skills, energy, and creativity to make warm in Terford a better place to live. So. Um, the the kind of the mission statement of the project, if you like, it's it's all about transforming lives, basically. Um, very quickly, you could ask uh, potentially why why Warming Tenford has received this significant amount of funding. Uh, there are many other areas of deprivation across Hartford, even though that Hartford is very often perceived as being a very leafly and affluent area. There are definitely pockets of poverty in both Warming and Tenford. Um, and again, I'll just uh, mention a few. Uh, for those who know Brogsmoor quite well, this is the only area of Brogsmoor which doesn't have a, a high street, so there are some significant infrastructure hurdles. And, you know, um, there is one in Hoddesdon, there's one in Chesham, there's one in Wogan Cross, and high street very often is a, a, a meeting point for residents which could help uh, to engage with, with, with the local community. And there are distinct, uh, distinct profiles of the community, some very affluent and some living in relative poverty. Uh, and there's um, uh, little connection, if you like, you could argue between uh, them two. Um, lack of youth provision, the health inequality, I think is quite a big thing as well. So uh, Brogsbon has one of the highest obesity and uh, levels um, in, in Hertfordshire, um, and it is far higher than national average. Such social, culture, and political disengagement of local residents. And again, one example, uh, local elections in 2019, only 22% of residents voted in local elections. So that, that the, this engagement is, is quite visible, if you like. Um, and in some parts of warming efforts, um, you know, as high as 30% of, of residents have no uh, gained any formal qualifications. Okay, over to uh, our lovely Sima. Oh, let's have the pictures because I don't have any prep necessarily. So um, you can see the pictures there on the left, the pop-up cinema. We collaborated with the church. We bought some equipment and were able to once a month put on a movie. It was quite well attended. Some weeks it wasn't, but other weeks it was amazing. We didn't know if it was depending on the film, but it did work. Um, mm -hmm. COVID has meant we've had to stop that at the moment. We have done trips to Leon C and a trip to the uh, Houses of Parliament, which, you know, almost full coaches went and a good time was had by all. It's something that a lot of local residents wouldn't normally be able to do. Um, and I remember speaking to people at the Leon C trip and um, you could see the deprivation that was there. And I have to admit that um, it's, it was a surprise to me. It's a surprise to me to see that in the area because there are so many affluent areas, affluent um, sections in the area that it, yeah, it's a bit of a shock. And okay, other items there. There's a, there was a film project. You can see bottom left is uh, in our, in the hub that we have now, one of those rooms. There was a film project they made an amazing film about the situation with the community center and the local shop because there was a possibility that they were going to be taken over by um to be built into houses to be redeveloped knocked down we were worried that we wouldn't get the space as a community center again even if they rebuilt with a community space in it would it be the same and if you look at the steel band picture to the right um, you can see the size of the hall. Would we get the same amount of space as that? We really could not be assured of that. Um, so that's, that's another activity, still banned in motion. They put on classes for anybody and it was really well attended. Through that, we have had other partnership members where they have joined because their children were involved in it and they were inspired. Um, to the left of that one, to my left. Oh no, I haven't finished. Walking group, we have a lady called Breeder, and she has up to 20 people at every session. She walks twice a week in the area. We're lucky. It's a nice area along the river, through the fields. Um, it's a beautiful walk. And these are health walks that she's been doing for quite some time. And she's a volunteer as well. 
uh, the top picture is just in our old hub, which was which Una will recognise. Um, uh, but it was quite a small space. It, it We couldn't engage a lot of people in there, I think. Okay, now I'm ready. Um, okay, ESOL classes we've done in conjunction with Haffles and um, yeah, I'm sure that was Haffles. So English for speakers of other languages. Um, we have an allotment. I think we have two allotments. We only had that for a couple of years maximum. Um, but you can see the seeds that were donated by a resident with a lovely letter. We've got the art projects, which is, um, yeah, art explorers. That was going on before COVID. Well attended, well liked, um, and for all ages as well. We did a youth project recently um, with the YMCA, and we did some consultation, and we just wanted to buy some table tennis tables, put them up, and, you know, let the kids come in and enjoy but we've been halted with that unfortunately um we've got a toddler group we had a toddler group rather um you can see how many people are in there one of our residents in fact our chair's daughter um started that and um yeah you can see they're all quite happy in the environment and the bottom left picture is where we actually attained that hub and it was being renovated for us so that we could use it properly. So there was a big change from the old hub to the new hub. This has got three or four rooms and we do have a section in there which we want to turn into a little community um, cafe. Not a cafe, um, coffee shop kind of thing. I don't know if cafe refers to a lot of food, drinks, toast, toasties, something like that, nothing more. Okay. Um, okay, the cake shown is made, I'm sure, with carrots from the allotment. We had another film project recently. Oh, that's with Trestle, Trestle Theatre and um, somebody else and Video Feet Productions. And they were doing a project only until la the last two weeks. The video isn't ready yet. It was about what Wormley in Turnford means to you. So we wanted people's individual stories about, you know, how they felt about the area. If they felt like it was really bad, we were saying, you need to say it, just be honest. And uh, yeah, we have a job um, job club, not a job club, what's it called? Mikhail, what's it called? Uh, we are promoting as well employment opportunities for local yes. residents. So mm -hmm. we're trying to share that. And we've also had a photography competition, hoping to do a calendar for next year. I've sent mm -hmm. some pictures. And we are also promoting local businesses as well. So people are getting in touch okay. with us and we're promoting it uh, via our social media channels. We have quite a few. Yeah. Yeah, you 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 sorry for um butting in there, but I think you you're hoping to incubate some community businesses as well, Mikhail, mm -hmm. aren't you? Brilliant. Yeah, I didn't know about that. Because <laughs> I'm all about just activity, because the next slide will show you what uh okay, this is. Last August, I had a notion when we had the hub and it was renovated a little bit, um, we had access to that back room that you can see. And I didn't even, I actually didn't even ask, but I just put a call out online if there was any, anybody interested in social sewing. And they were the people that turned up on the first night. No, this is not the first night actually, because it was about 15 of us on the first night. Some people dropped out, but six people from that group is what turned into the um, to a main part of the scrub hub. So when COVID hit and the scrub issue, the scrub, scrub crisis hit, um, we were able to join in. One of our ladies um, was a, like a highly into politics. She's a liberal Democrat. One of her fellow liberal Democrats was involved in the scrub hub and we joined. But because of the access to the community center, we, Lewis Cocking, the leader of the um, council here, granted us use of the community center. Um, and you can see the bottom two photographs there. That's how socially distanced we were. We were able to be in there because there was only a few of us who said that we could volunteer that much time. But you can see we were able to make scrubs, insets, Everybody learned something as well. We had ladies who said, I don't want to do this. I can't do it. And we just said, just do, you know, just finish it because you learn so much. Those people are now making um, items for themselves for the first time. Um, the, 
the little picture on the far right, actually, you can see everybody at work on a Monday night, um, helping each other, learning from each other. The crochet, the, the picture of yarn there with the crochet dolls, one of our ladies is, has made all of those, but she's also taught a few of the others crochet for the first time and they have produced similar looking items already. And it's been such a learning curve. And okay, there's a new cushion for the, uh, out of some donated fabric. It was the right colors, as you can see from the slide, the green and blue. Mm. So, you know, it's about being resourceful and, and just letting people do something. The cushion cover isn't quite the right shape, but you know what? It's a fresh cushion cover. It's okay, I'm not gonna complain. And that's it really. I don't know if that was what, oh no, it's not it. So uh, now, Michal, I'll let you do this. Very, very quickly as well. So, I mean, it's uh, the, the success of the uh, sewing uh, sewing project, sewing beast project is, is all down, down to SEMA. And this project has continued, as SEMA said, throughout the lockdown, absolutely incredible um, to see how successful it was and how uh, vibrant, you know, uh, it is. Um, very quickly, literally last slide to say that uh, our next few months and, and a year possibly are really um, extremely important for the project. We are um, in the middle of writing our next community plan. So um, uh, we need to spend all our funding by 2026. The current plan uh, ends at the end of December. Really, really interesting exercise, um, which will involve as well community consolation, many other things. Um, now we're looking at evaluating how the project is actually impacting local residents. We are about to sign um, a lease on the community center. So we're taking over the community center from the Brosman Council. We're hoping that this will be done in the next couple of months. We're also recruiting quite heavily at the moment for the project manager for the community center, mainly around the kind of refurbishment work and working with architects, making sure that the building is um, fit for purpose. Launching a lot of different projects, uh, building better opportunities, is using our hub, Job Smart with the council and a couple of other partners as well as social prescribers. Absolutely wonderful model. Um, again, they're using our hub uh, at the moment. Uh, again, it's all about leaving a long lasting legacy and obviously making sure that the project is sustainable. Then it is all about building, building kind of, you know, co uh, collaborative uh, uh, partnership arrangements uh, with, with local agencies. Um, that's us. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Really, really to hear kind of all the different projects you've been putting on over the years now. Um, thought that was really, really good. Is there, is this brilliant? Is there any questions for Mikhail and for Seema, who, who are both so enthusiastic about all the different projects that they've been putting on and how they're kind of trying to make their community a much, much better place and other communities too? I have to add, I'm not sure how we've succeeded in that yet, but we're trying. That's sometimes just a journey as well. <laughs> and it goes on. Um, if there isn't any immediate questions for Mikhail and Seema, then I would just like to thank you both um, for now. We obviously have a little bit more time at the end, um, but without further ado now, I would like to hand over to the fabulous Vic Hobson from Mudlarks in Hartford. Um, and um, Vic, I let you talk about Mudlarks and all the things that you have been doing to improve the community especially in Hartford, um, over the years. Over to you, thank you. There we go, unmute myself first is a good idea. <laughs> Hi, thanks, Corinna. Um, so Mudlarks is a charity in Hartford for people who have learning disabilities. And many years ago, I was a teacher at a school called Lakeside. And one of the ladies here today, Jenny, said to me while I was teaching, oh, you'd love a community garden in St Albans. So I went to see it and she was right. And it struck me that people leaving school with learning disabilities didn't have always somewhere very positive to go, somewhere that was meaningful, that was rewarding, and that was the equivalent of having a job, you know, it was a lifetime um, activity. So this is a bit of a whistle stop tour of setting something up from scratch, um, which may initially seem daunting, um, but you can overcome it. So this is where we started. 
Um, so I went to the town council and the uh, district council and asked if they had some land. Um, and they offered three sites, but I very specifically wanted the site for Mudlocks to be community-based. So there are projects that run out of town and hidden away. And that was absolutely not what I wanted for our community. I don't think that people with disabilities should be hidden away. So we chose this piece of land because it was on a bus route for people who had learnt how to use buses and had done some travel training and was surrounded by houses and other allotment holders so that the people with disabilities there were no different from the rest of the community. And that's what it looks like today. And that has all happened with the hard work of community and local people, and most importantly, people with learning disabilities. So getting started, how you sort of <laughs> create a vision out of something like this. I was very lucky. At the time, the social workers offices were community based. So I could walk into an office and say to the social workers there, this is what I want to do, this is my vision. And so I was able to um, bring people in to the idea. Um, that would be more difficult now, now that places in Stevenage, you know, they're behind locked doors, you have to have a pass to get in. That is definitely a barrier to setting up this kind of community project. Um, Luckily, because I was able to access social work teams, um, from the very outset, we had people with learning disabilities and that was also important. I didn't want it to be a created thing that was given to the community. I very much wanted the community to create it. So um, there was a Mencap house down Ware Road in Hartford. The men there had been doing very little. And so their social worker was delighted to be able to bring those people into mudlocks. So we had a shed that came out of my garden and a pile of sand. I knew a farmer who lent us his truck and filled it up with manure for us. It was very much community people getting involved on a very, very basic level. And that is absolutely how mudlocks started. My old garden shed, a pile of manure, and some people with learning difficulties. And the chap standing on the path there to this day stands on that very same spot, even though now it's a beautiful allotment site that's developed all around him. And that was our first harvest. So it's quick. The good thing about these sort of projects is you have a very quick result. You know, you can take a small bit of that land, plant vegetables in it, and for everybody that's involved, you've got a very quick reward. And I think that's quite important for all of these projects is that there's a sort of a, a quick result, even if it's a very small one. And then of course we needed more help. So um, I went out to local companies and said, we've got this lovely bit of land, but four people with disabilities and two volunteers um, are not gonna get very far very quickly. So we had Glaxo involved, we had O2 involved, any company that was prepared to send out people for a day of volunteering, we got them in and created this. So we turned the field into a bit of flat land. Um, every half term, every holiday, my children were there all the time, everybody else's friends, children were there all the time. Um, flattened off our piece of land. We still, as you can see, only had two very small sheds, but we did at least have a flat piece of land. And we needed a better shed. So um, keeping aware of what's going on in your community is really important when you're starting one of these sort of projects. And the Van Hague's at Bradbury End on the way to Stevenage was closing. And you have to be quite ballsy as well when you're setting something up with no money. Um, so I knocked on the door and said, I need a shed and persuaded them to give us their old swimming pool shed. And then I got hold of everybody I knew that had a truck or a trailer and got them to transport the old swimming pool shed down to Hartford so that we could rebuild it on our allotment site. And that was a fantastic moment. And we now have a shed that looks like this. Um, it was challenging, there is no doubt it was challenging. Um, a lot of the council were not keen for us to have this big shed. Um, but actually that ended up being a good thing because by the time we got it, we'd got this vast community of people who had been outraged that the council wouldn't let us have a shed and had come to all the council meetings. 
So actually the battle ended up being a positive and it really helped to build up community support. We'd written articles in the local paper, which meant that more people knew what we were doing. And it really did have a very positive longer term effect. Um, the shed is completely um, green. It's got no foundations. It's got recycled insulation. It's got a green roof. Um, so it's properly apt for an allotment site. We also went out and did other community gardening projects. So I thought that if we weren't just based on our own side, we went out and helped other people. Again, it would help to spread the word and get more people to know about us. So this was actually in the Pinetum up at Bayfordbury. Um, so we went and did some community work up there. And then at the time in Hartford, there was a wonderful place called Vale House, which was for people who were in recovery from drug and alcohol addiction. And they were looking for things for these people to do after their sort of six months of rehabilitation. Very few places would take people with criminal records and criminal backgrounds. So we did, it seemed to me like an excellent partnership. These are very able-bodied people who are wanting to do something now in their communities that need support. And we had by now got this lovely community of people with disabilities and we needed more help and volunteers. So we started off on the allotment site. And then I approached the town council again and said, look, this is now the situation. And we won the contract to manage all of the town council's gardens. So we redesigned the gardens at the castle, all with people with disabilities making the decisions and the choices, and created this wonderful rose garden and topiary garden at the castle, which now every time someone gets married there, um, it's the mudlarks gardens in the background. Our gardeners have so much pride in this beautiful, very public space. We also do the gardens up at St. Leonard's and in a couple of the churchyards. Then I went to, and it's, I keep sort of saying, you know, this happened and that happened. And I think my point is, it's really important that you stay connected with your community. Go to everything, go to every meeting, get to know as many people as you possibly can, because they are going to be helpful. You need people to be on side, to understand. And it's not always about giving you money. Often it's about putting in the right word, you know, and helping you out. So I'd gone to a police meeting and they were talking about how vulnerable elderly people are in their homes because their front gardens look untidy. So for anyone who's a ne'er-do-well walking down the road, it's very clear who you can target. So I thought, well, we can solve that problem. So we set up a team called Special Branch and they are specifically a learning disabled team who go and help elderly people in their gardens. That's a very lovely little community project. And as a result of all of this, this is now going on some years, um, more and more people were saying to me, we'd really like a job, an actual job that is paid. And that is very hard. And as you've heard from all the other community groups, the vast majority are led by volunteers. You don't have a lot of spare money. But, you know, nationally, 90% of people with a disability want a job and 7% have got a job. You know, it's wrong. It's and then you get involved in work solutions type projects and they don't support people with disabilities as well as they need supporting. So I thought, well, we'll set it up ourselves then. So this little building became vacant in Hartford. So for a very low rent and therefore low risk, we took this on as a one year pop up and it was incredibly popular. People with learning disabilities who wanted a job came and instantly we had over 20 people that we employed in the cafe. Absolutely delightful. So that was a success. So then the shop next door came free. So we took on the shop next door. And that's the other thing about setting up these community projects. You have to be adaptable. Things will change. There will be stumbling blocks. You have to be resilient and you have to overcome all these changes. So we took on the shop next door. I thought that would be our forever home, put a lot of effort into setting up the shop. And then three years later, the landlord said he was going to develop it for flats. So we've moved again. But every time something happens that appears to be something that's getting in the way, it becomes positive. Our new cafe is 
even better than the last one. We have people queuing outside the door. And what I absolutely love about it is that this incredibly popular cafe with this queue of people is the only cafe in the town that pays 26 people with learning disabilities to work there. And I think as a town, that has got to be a success. Um, and it's, it is community ownership. It's community recognition of everything that can be achieved by our whole community. And then just by the by, along the way, we've also set up a forest school, um, which is up at Pan's Hangar Park in the woods at the top there. So it all costs money. Um, our turnover now annually is over half a million. So everything's expensive. Staff, rents, insurance, transport, it's all expensive. I would strongly recommend that you diversify your funding stream. Don't ever be reliant on one source of funding. So we are about a third funded by the County Council. So that pays for sort of social placements for people with disabilities. We are about a third funded by large grants and trusts. We write bids um, for big grants. Um, and then we are about a third funded by our community with fundraising events and that kind of thing. So some of the events people organise for us, that is the best kind of event. <laughs> Other people do the work and they give you a cheque. That's magnificent. Some events we organise ourselves. And again, sort of events are important. They are community building. We do this lovely river swim. We do bike rides around Hertfordshire. And you're sort of trying to tap into something that appeals to everyone. So be as diverse as you can. Quiz nights are great. There are people that like to do a quiz, but there are people that don't want to do a quiz and they want to ride a bike. So try and find things that everybody can get involved with. Um, we make things to sell as well. So every Christmas, um, these look really simple, but they are so popular. Um, the gardeners love making them. The tree surgeons bring us all the wood um, and we can earn a thousand pounds selling reindeer every Christmas. So that's perfect. The other thing you have to constantly be thinking about is how you adapt and change and develop. Don't think you've done it and sit back. Um, particularly if you're looking for grant funding, trust funding, that kind of thing, they won't fund um, ongoing projects. It's a bit of a problem in some senses, but it keeps you on your toes and keeps you thinking and keeps you adapting and developing. Our next plan is that we want to find a bit of land to put some of these lovely polytunnels on. Um, the cafe, uh, one of the main things we spend money on is salads. Everybody's food gets a salad on the side. Um, I think we could grow that all ourselves. And I think that would be a lovely project for some of our more autistic gardeners who like things to be sort of regimented, who like sewing, putting things in rows, watering. And I would love for there to be a little mudlarks box scheme van that goes around again with some of our gardeners delivering fresh vegetables to the community. So that's our next project. Um, as I said, you have to be determined. I can remember about two or three years in, I was at the point of the curve where, you know, you sort of start off and you think you have a great idea and then it goes down and you are exhausted. Don't imagine for a second if you're setting up a community project, it is not absolutely exhausting. You will give your whole life to it. Your children will be involved. Your partners will be involved. No one gets away with anything. You'll be doing an event on a Saturday and baking a cake on a Sunday. It's very, very hard work, but it is absolutely worth it. It is magnificent. The rewards are untold and you will come out of the trough. You will go back up. You will get back to the point where you thought it was a good idea and it was a good idea. So don't give up. We celebrated our 10th year a couple of years ago. Very, very delighted. I didn't think we'd do quite as much as we have done in 12 years. Um, so yeah, do it. If you've got an idea, do it. Oh, thank you so much, Victoria. It's fantastic. It's so heartwarming to hear. Um, um, I, I am kind of lost for words really because I, I hope that you all kind of feel how kind of how much energy, how much positivity is coming across, how resilient we can be as human beings, as communities, if we come together um, 
and we humans just come in all shapes and sizes and 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 we all have different skills um because before i talk a little bit more about where you could possibly look for funding which is obviously very competitive at the moment in hertfordshire um is there any more kind of burning questions for vic hobson right now I we're running Hey, yeah, Karina, I, I'm aware that it's already, you know, almost 10 to 12. I just want to say, um, Victoria, one of the most inspiring presentation I've seen in, in ages. Um, I, it, you are just, a, you know, kind of a walking angel. I think that um, we can all learn so much from you. And I'm delighted that you were invited because, um, again, I feel kind of re-energized as well, even to do more. Um, incredible, to, uh, you've achieved, uh, you know, a Nobel Prize uh, to you and to your team. Um, so yeah, keep, keep, keep it up. A quick question on how, how are, you, are you stuck up as a legal entity? Are you stuck up as a, chari a charitable incorporated organization as well? Yeah, um, kind of I'm, think, I'm, th I'm, I'm thinking only because um, when you're running some different things, it's often difficult to make decisions you know uh, as a partnership you know uh, and, and stuff like that how were you able to overcome some of these difficulties particularly around governance and and big decisions strategic decisions you know which can help you to move the project forward yeah so because um so i set us up as a charity in 2008 so you have to have a certain amount of money in the bank before you can become a charity so it took a few years um, but as soon as that happened, then absolutely, you have a team of trustees. We used to have sort of monthly group meetings to go through ideas. And the other thing that I did very early on, as soon as I could, was that I employed someone to be an administrator um, because you can't do it all. You know, you end up writing funding bids at nine o'clock till midnight, um, you know, and then starting again the next day. So, yeah, be honest with yourself. You can't do it all. Mm -hmm points to just add as well number one um it's about the project that you've got there is one it, it's focused and i realize how our difficulties are coming up because we're trying to appeal to more people um not more people we're trying to appeal to everybody in the local area um by doing lots of little things but this project it, it it's it's able to grab more people's attention but by doing one thing really really well and i think that's incredible i think it's amazing and i think we should do something like that just kind of like focus um the other thing is i love your powerpoint to the point you explained it titles love it that's all yeah thank you so much victoria that was really really um heartwarming, interesting, grabbed our attention and everything was in there. Um, but I promised you a little bit um, to point you in directions if you're now all ready and itching to go to set up you, your tiny little community huddle or your bubble um, or if you're ready to kind of convert an existing um, normal enterprise into a community business because um, you've just felt this energy um, from us kind of in the room today. I would like to kind of just give you a few points as where you possibly could get some um, funding from. And for that, if Helen could kind of ca um, kindly share the slides now, then that would be brilliant. That's brilliant. So um, actually, um, one thing that also struck me victoria um it's and it, you're absolutely right that um it's important to have a kind of sustainable um a, a funding mix really but what i really loved hearing of you is just knocking on people's doors and asking if you don't ask you don't get and that is really your easiest um funding tool i would say and also kind of networking speaking to people working together and that's what this event today is, is hopefully showing you as well that we we are all here together to support each other and it would be really lovely if we could kind of carry on um, giving each other support but because that's really important for funding as well how did you get about it where did you get your funding from um and kind of learn learn your lessons but if um helen you could put up the the next slide please i will just very briefly um give you a few pointers um 
Deborah from Wigington mentioned Crowdfunder. Crowdfunder can be used for a community share offer, but also Crowdfunder, um, on Crowdfunder at the moment, you can access quite a few um, Hertfordshire specific um, funding pots. Um, there is the projects that matter in Hertfordshire. Um, there is also something just for East Hearts and there is a community innovation fund and we will um, we will send you the slides afterwards so don't feel like you have to kind of track down the, the links like now I really just want to very very briefly um, give you an overview um, if you are or, so that's for the communities if you're already um, a business um, there is also a small business innovation fund again accessible through crowdfunder but also please um, for existing businesses who are now inspired to maybe think about a, a, an employee buyout, buyout or, or any other um, pivoting or transformation. Um, please also speak to the Hertfordshire Growth Hub who wants to hear from you. Um, also kind of third sector organizations who are here um, can access support and help from the from the Hertfordshire Growth Hub. So please um, go and go and, and visit them as well. And of course, there's um, for sorry, going back to communities, um, help from the Hertfordshire um, from the CVS for Broxbourne and East Hearts. Um, there's also community action in the quorum who can support you. So that's where you can get a little bit more help in terms of funding. And I've got um, one more slide about funding. Helen, if you could just um, skip forward to the next one. Um, now, beyond Hertfordshire, um, you also have kind of nation, national, um, national funding pots. Um, there's the Community Business Trade-Up Program. Um, most of them are from Power to Change at the moment. Um, there is um, a Trade-Up Program, so if you want to grow. Um, there is something especially for health and social care um, ongoing in the community of practice, which is really, really topical and really needed at the moment. The Power of Change also um, had the um, Bright Ideas Fund, which is really there for um, startups, if you like, or community organizations who might um, have an idea. And I know that, for example, Wigington looked at the Bright Ideas Fund funding application at the, at the a few years back. And um, from that, they also discovered how much more they needed to develop their project actually in order to be ready for funding. So it's always a, a good exercise to maybe um, ha have, have a go at a funding application just for the fun of it <laughs> and to learn from it really. But um, going back to the Bright Ideas Fund, it, um, it, 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 it is on and off at the moment. Um, so keep an eye on it. It's currently not active, but it might become active again. So keep an eye on that. Funding moves on very, very quickly at the moment. Obviously a lot is related to COVID, but there is a lot and a lot now for community because there is really a, a, this, this sense of community spirit that has kind of helped us through the first kind of lockdown that is carrying us with this positive energy that I'm hoping we're really feeling today. And the funders have picked up on that and local authorities are picking up on it and government. So please just join, join the movement. Um, it's, 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 it's a good time. It gives you something positive to focus on to kind of improve your community. If it's just mutual aid, if it's a little community organization, a little group come together, grow it bigger when you're ready. Um, and funding, funding is there, but funding is, uh, is highly competitive. But come in and chat to me as well if you want to hear more about um, funding. So before we go in a few minutes, final q and I would just like to bring up um, the next slide, which is just going to um, I'll just give you a little overview where you can, um, if you're ready to find out more, um, where you can find out um, a bit more. If Helen could just give us the next slide. Um, I'm sorry, have we got it? Oh, yes. So obviously, please, please, please um, contact The Hive um, and it's www.thehive.coop. If um, The Hive operates all over the UK and it's for rural and urban, if you're in a um, rural 
um, location and you are specifically thinking about community shops or community pubs, um, then you can also get in touch with the Plunkett Foundation, who works also with the Hive, but also have specialist advisors that can help you, especially around community shops and pubs. Check out their um, webinars as well that you can attend. Please also contact your local CVSs, your community actions, speak to your local councillors, district and um, um, ward councillors, wherever you are. Um, speak to your local economic development um, team. And we've got obviously Helen here from Ambition Broxbourne, which is really, really fantastic. But speak to them more, try to kind of attend digital events, which you can attend so much easier, I found now um, than, than before. Um, also for social enterprises in, in Hertfordshire um, and obviously in the East of England, there's Social Enterprise East of England. Um, they are also putting on webinars. They also have a little kind of coffee morning every last Friday of the month around about 11 o'clock. Um, very friendly, that's a virtual one come along, still virtual cake. <laughs> um, inspire to enterprise.org can help you with starting up as well. And don't forget that there's um, Wenta, who is the Hertfordshire um, Business Support Agency and also Stanta, who is over in St Albans, who can help you with all of that. So there is a lot and a lot of help um, out there. So I would like, Helen, if you can just bring up the, the last little slide um, for me to just to hand over now um, to our final little Q&A, and we only got two minutes left. <laughs> um, if there's any questions, please just unmute yourself and just fire away to, um, to our, our lovely, lovely guest speakers, uh, so inspiring. Um, or um, or um, type something in in the chat. <laughs> 